Okay? Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we just come to you now with grateful hearts. Thank you for the opportunity to gather together, both in person and uh, in spirit, as those join us online. Uh, we pray for uh, your church, Lord, during this time. We pray and ask for your blessing upon the church and on all of us who who are gathered together to worship you. Let this be a day of rejoicing. Let this be a day of encouragement. Let this be a day that challenges us to align ourselves more closely to you and to what you're doing. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I honestly have to say that I feel like it has gone by so fast that I reconsidered with myself, myself this morning if I had done this lesson already. I was like, how long have I been here for? Have I done this one? But I haven't. I don't think anyways. So, anyways, we will start with announcements and then move into our kid corner lesson. So, Bible study, this will be my last one to do this Wednesday over Skype. Um, and it, it worked out perfect because we're finishing First Peter, so that worked out well. And then VBS, it is our very last week, which is just well because seven weeks has flown by and we have seen really good participation, we have seen community recognition, we have like seen just great support from those, definitely within our church. Um, Chris has given me a lot of credit this morning, which is very nice, but really all of it is to the volunteers and to God who has just blessed our program and given us opportunity and chances to reach out. And so all glory and praise to him, because really, I'm just a person who talks a lot. So, <laughs> some days, <laughs> mothers ain't many. Um, some days that's all I am, but with, with God, um, we have had the opportunity to do, to do some really great things. And so this week, to go with PBS, uh, we're doing our last packages they'll get on Wednesday. Um, they will be invited to our church for a kind of um, send-off, some, summer send-off. Um, but that will be at the very end of August, so they will get an invite for that, um, but they'll also get an invite to watch us online because not a, a lot of families, really only like five families could join us this morning, so a lot will be invited to join us online. And then this week we are doing our letter writing activity, so you might have noticed the really fun mailbox on your way in. That is for our activity for VBS this week. What the kids were invited to do, they were given a card, an envelope, and invited to write a letter that would be delivered to the nursing home market. And so you guys are also all able to do that as well, or anyone in our community, if you wanted to write an encouraging letter or draw a picture or something like that and drop it off in the mailbox, they'll be delivered later. And so that's kind of what's happening with VBS. And again, I just want to give all credit and all thanks to our amazing volunteers. So, um, talk, speaking of volunteers, I'm going to need two very brave volunteers this morning. Do I have any takers? I have Dixie. And then I need a young at heart willing to risk it, gutsy, brave adult to come help her. So Dixie, you can stand on that side. And I'm still going to need one other person. Oh, Pat's going to join us. Okay, so, question for our church member, or those here this morning. You can be on this side. So, um, what is the difference between salt and sugar? <laughs> one sweet, one salty. That's what Dixie said. Any other... Points. What is salt used for that sugar is not used for? Preserving. Preserving. Makes things sour. Um, Salt's good for french fries and sugars. French fries, yes. I, I don't know anyone who puts sugar on their french fries. So, I'm placing salt and sugar, I'm going to set this down for a moment, on your plates. And then we're going to really trust, test, because you say they taste different. We're going to see if they really do. Okay, so now, Dixie, I need you to look that way, and I'm going to mix up all your plates so you don't know which is which. Okay. And Pat, I need you to look that way, and I'm just going to, you just have one dish. Yes. Because that's all that fits. You might be able to look and tell, but... Alright, anyway, so you, you're going to have to pick up your plate, and you can put your tongue on it, um, but I'd ask you just to go the farthest you can that way when you take your mask off to lick your plate. And you're going to tell us which one's salt and which one's sugar. You don't have to use a lot, and I have snacks for after, so you get rid of that nasty attitude. <laughs> so you can take your mask off and just lick your plate, and you're going to tell us all which one's salt and which one's sugar. I'm going to lick the plate. <laughs> yeah. Probably don't want to use your fingers because COVID. Is that one sugar or salt? Sugar. Sugar. Which one did you have? Is that sugar or salt? Sugar. So the next one. You just gonna have to test it. Maybe, maybe they're both actually sugar. Cause she's like, no, they're not. Uh, what is it? Salt. That was salt. You're right. It is. Awesome. There you go, Dixie. <laughs> and thank you, Pat, to prove that. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> so you got the salt. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So that's to prove to us that salt is in 
indeed very different than sugar. And you guys can have a seat. Thank you. A big round of applause for our volunteers. Very gutsy. I had um, a bunch of students at camp once, and I made them do it. But they, they did have it a little better off. They had uh, regular French uh, regular chips and salted chips. So they just sat there munching on chips, being like, yes, Maddie, we're listening to you so much. So they had a little easier than just looking straight salt. But anyway, so our Bible verse this week, we can go to that. It highlights the story. So this is Jesus talking to his disciples and others, and kind of giving us instruction on what Christians should be like. Um, Christians should almost, maybe not in a negative way, but we should realize that they're different than everyone else. Just like how Dixie and Pat clearly knew the salt was not the sugar. They knew. There was no doubt about it. So in the same way, when we are interacting with the world, we should not necessarily be just like the world. Uh, God calls us to live um, in a way that honors Him, so that's not going to look necessarily like everyone else. Not everyone um, worships God. Not everyone comes on a Sunday to sing songs to someone. That might not make sense to someone who's not a Christian. And so that's an easy example, example. but there's many examples. We talk a lot about them in our Bible study class of how can I interact in a way in my community that shows I love God, not that I'm not just like everyone else. I, I want to show everyone I love God because I want them to love God too. So for our Bible verse this week, if you are under the age of, how old am I? I'm 22. If you are 22 or younger, you can just memorize the first bit. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> if you are um, in our kids' ministry, you can memorize the first sentence, and everyone else, um, you are invited to memorize the whole bit. The first part of it just highlights that we are the salt of the earth, so we are supposed to be different. People are supposed to know, not when they taste us, because no one's going to be licking us, but when they interact with us, that we're different. And the rest of this verse speaks to how um, when the salt loses its saltiness, it can't get it back. It's important that we stay salty, in, in a ma manner of speaking. And because without that saltiness, we're not necessarily useful, because we're not going to be pointing people to Christ. So, um, if you are a child or in our kids' ministry program, you can memorize that first sentence. You are the salt of the earth, and everyone else is invited to memorize the whole thing. Again, if you um, are sending me proof, you can get some ice cream during the week. Um, but let's do this all together, um, starting at, at you. So let's do it all together. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its salty taste, it cannot be made salty. It is good for nothing. It must be thrown out for people to walk on. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. So that is our verse this week. And I would remind you and leave you with a reminder for this week that we do need to be different in our community. We need to be, we need to be showing that Christians are not like everyone else. We are called to a life that honors Christ. And we are called to radically love our neighbors. So you know what I left with that is I want to have french fries. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, with sugar. Well, if you know how much ketchup I put on my fries, you'd say with sugar. <laughs> there you go. Well, guys, today we're going to be back in our uh, study of the book of Acts. We are reading Acts chapter 14, verse 8 to 20. That's Acts chapter 14. Verses 8 to 20. I'm going to start off today with a little game. Everyone likes games, I hope. Um, so it's been almost a half a year since we've uh, been affected by the realities of COVID-19. And this pandemic has really been trying, not just for those who have gotten sick, but as I shared at the beginning of our service, all of us who are just trying our very best to live a life as normal as we can during the pandemic. And, you know, who would ever have thought you go to, before going into a bank, you would put a mask on, <laughs> right? You know, well, it's normal, it's not normal anymore. So it's hard to believe when you think about this, because the time for me this year has been warped, you know? I, sometimes I feel like things have just started, other times it feels like it's lasted forever. It's hard to believe that at the beginning of 2020, you know, this idea of this novel coronavirus was just this 
weird thing you've got little blurbs on the news that was happening in Asia that, you know, was started in China and, you know, it just sounded like, wow, that's, that's not a good thing. Hopefully they get that under control. Fast forward the, our time to now and we are all somewhat experts on this COVID-19 virus. We have a really good idea of what this virus does and um, you know what we can do to prevent it. So um, we're going to play this game, and, and it's a trivia game. It's just to test out our knowledge about what we can do to reduce the spread of COVID-19. And the game is simple. All I need you to do is raise your hand if you think these questions are true. So let's test this out. Raise your hand right now. Just raise it. Okay, your arms are all working, so you know how to do this. You're following us online. <laughs> if you're following us online, you go right ahead and raise your right hand too, or your left hand, doesn't matter, just raise a hand. Okay, question one. Are you ready? Does hand washing reduce the spread of COVID-19? Raise your hand if you think it's true. All right. Yes, studies have shown that washing our hands with soap and water is one of the most effective ways of reducing the spread of any virus, so including COVID-19. There you go. Question two, does practicing social distancing, like not shaking hands or gathering our large numbers in small spaces, or I guess all looking from the same plate, <laughs> does, does that reduce the spread of COVID-19? Raise your hand if you think so. Yeah. You know, by practicing social distancing, we reduce the chances of coming in contact with someone who's infected with COVID-19, and thereby we reduce the spread of the virus. Question three. Okay, now this one's a little trickier because there is uh, debate on it, but here we go. Does wearing a mask reduce the spread of COVID-19? Raise your hand if you think so. Okay. Studies show that wearing a mask can help reduce the spread of COVID-19. If a person has COVID-19, so a person who's infected is wearing a mask, when they're coughing, that mask can block some of the droplets that we expel when we cough, you know, some of the larger ones. Not all, and it should be said that wearing a mask alone will not prevent the spread of the virus. All right, question four. Notice these are getting a little harder. All right, here's another one for you. Does what, consuming large amounts of alcohol prevent COVID-19? <laughs> Raise your hand if you think that's true. If you drink and drink and drink booze, Will that reduce <laughs> the COVID-19? No. Ingesting, I'm, I'm worried here, this is a Wesleyan church. <laughs> no. And if my district superintendent is here and you're watching this right now, no. <laughs> no. Ingesting alcohol will not prevent a person from contracting the virus. In fact, heavy use of alcohol will, over time, weaken our immune systems and reduce the body's ability to cope with the virus. All right, question five, and here's my last question for you, and you're doing really well. Does taking the malaria drug hydroxychloroquine prevent a person from contracting COVID-19? I'm, I'm seeing some net head shaking, no. The answer is no, it doesn't. For a time, there was debate about it. There was, there was actual studies on this, but it shows that it's had no evidence to, this drug has had no evidence of, uh, of preventing someone from getting COVID-19. So taking this drug will not stop someone from getting the virus. So I thank you all for playing that game. Since the pandemic started, health officials have been sharing the steps we can take to protect ourselves, and just as important, and I feel like for myself, at least more important, I'm never worried about myself, but I'm that kid who would always do the stunts and be found broken at the bottom, and never worried about me, it's always the people around me. So I say it, it's also, what I think is important, is it protects others from the virus. And yet there's been a lot of debate surrounding these steps, even though there is scientific evidence to back each of them up. There are many who have pushed back on these preventative steps and have refused to believe in the scientific evidence and or follow the, the preventative steps that uh, are recommended. 
People like Prime Minister uh, of Britain, the Prime Minister of Britain, Boris Johnson, uh, he minimized the idea of social distancing. Even though his country was enacting it, he was known, and he admitted it, he didn't practice it. He was shaking people's hands and what have you. And guess what? He got the virus. Or people like the, uh, the president of Brazil, and his name is Jair Bolsonaro, who didn't believe in social distancing either. And he uh, was a big proponent, and, and still is a big proponent, of the malaria drug hydroxychloroquine. He contracted the virus. Or finally, the president of Belarus, Alexander Lukashenko. Did I say that right? Lukashenko? I think so. I tried to say it right. But anyway, if I said his name wrong, I apologize. He was against any restrictions to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And he was the one who suggested that people drink vodka and go into the sauna and to stay healthy. I like the sauna part. I don't think that's going to help reduce the virus, but it would be nice just to relax in the sauna once in a while. He too contracted COVID-19. Now each of these men uh, have, by the way, survived their, the COVID-19. But not everyone who followed what they were saying has. And these, these were men who refused to accept the evidence and refused to accept the truth. Today we're going to be talking about truth as we look at what happened to the Apostle Paul and to his friend and fellow believer and worker Barnabas. We're only reading a small section of this, of this chapter, so if you'd like to have a bigger picture, as we study the, the book of Acts, I would encourage you to read chapter 13 and 14 later today. So before we jump into our scripture, I'd like to take a moment to pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, as we look at this account, and as we take time to consider the subject of truth, we ask that you speak to us today through your word. Bless this time we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So we're into Acts chapter 14, verse 8 to 20. In Lystra there sat a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith and faith to be healed, and called out, Stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw that Paul had what what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lycidonian language, "The gods have come down to us in human form." Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bowls and wreaths to the city gates because uh, because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd shouting, Friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human, like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way, yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their season. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stood and they stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. So I got to ask, what happened? I mean, everything seemed to be going well in Lystra. In fact, it seemed to be following the same pattern as we saw in Acts 3. This is one of the cool things when we study a, a whole book, we're getting a bigger picture. Some of the things that we've seen in the previous chapters that we've looked at are starting to sound like, I remember that, right? And so, it sounds like the same pattern as we saw in Acts 3, when the Apostle Peter healed the lame man in Jerusalem, who had spent his lifetime begging for handouts near the temple. 
So here we see in this account, the Apostle Paul, he looks at the lame man before him, sees he has faith, and tells him to stand up. And the man, without any hesitation, does exactly what he's told. I mean, I, I think that's pretty cool. The man is healed. Praise God. That would be an awesome to see. I mean, that would be exciting to see. Now, back in Acts 3, when uh, Peter healed the lame man, this opened a door in which people stopped. And often that's when we see these miracles happen. It's not the, for the sake of the miracle. Miracles point to something. They provide opportunities. And so we see that in, in Acts 3, Peter, when he, when he healed the man, people stopped what they were doing and they listened. I mean, they really listened to Peter as he uh, shared the gospel, as he shared about Jesus with them. And many people who heard believed. Now, Paul probably heard about this experience and he was probably expecting the same opportunity. Not necessarily the same results, but to say, hey, now that this man's healed, they're going to stop and listen to me. And that's all he wanted to do was share the gospel. But before he gets a chance to say a word, the people excitedly proclaim that Paul and Barnabas are gods. Barnabas being Zeus and Paul being Hermes. In their excitement, the priests of Zeus go out and, uh, to meet them, and they're prepared to offer sacrifices and everything. I mean, you can tell that the, the story of this is just getting way out of control. You know, you ever be in one of those situations where you do something and all of a sudden everything kind of spins out of control? Paul's probably going, what's going on? But our scripture goes on to say, but when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard, that, heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd shouting, friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human, like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God. I mean, still, pretty exciting moment. Still, a lot of potential. But it wasn't long, though, and the, apostle, uh, the, the people turned on them. They turned on them. One moment, the people are proclaiming Paul and Barnabas are gods, and next, they're dragging Paul out after they stoned him. And they thought he was dead. One moment, they're saying, you're a god. The next, he's laying on the ground, a, a bloody mess, unconscious, left for dead. Again, I ask, what happened? I would argue that the people of Lystra were confronted with a truth. A truth that they were unprepared or unwilling to accept. And when confronted with this truth, they did what a lot of people do. They did what a lot of people so often try and do. They felt threatened and they lashed out. They got angry and decided to hit. They ridiculed and attacked and they did their best to destroy the truth. We have a responsibility to the truth, even more so when it comes to faith and God's word. As people who claim to be followers of Christ, truth has to be paramount in our life. We have no right to pick and choose when it comes to what the Bible says. And people do. They try really hard to ignore things from the Bible and to promote other things, to take verses out of context to justify their truth. Thomas Jefferson was one of the founding fathers of the United States. He was instrumental in crafting their Declaration of Independence. He was also their third president from 1797 to 1801. Now, you've probably heard of Thomas Jefferson and the impact he had on the United States. But did you know that Thomas Jefferson created his own Bible? He created his own Bible. Jefferson was known to be devout to the teachings of Jesus, but he didn't agree with everything um, that was found in the Bible, especially when it came to, uh, the, came to the miraculous parts that we see in the Bible. And so what did Jefferson do? Well, Jefferson took a New Testament, got one of the New Testaments, and he got a knife. He got a pen knife. And he started cutting away the sections of the Bible 
he didn't like. And so he was cutting away, and he, he took things away, anything that was miraculous, you know, any of the miraculous events, such as feeding of the 5,000 with two fish and five loaves of bread, he also cut away the resurrection as he didn't believe that could happen. In essence, Jefferson rejected, he rejected, and thereby cut away anything to do with Christ's divinity. He just saw Jesus as a moral teacher. And so Jefferson's Bible, uh, if you can call it a Bible, I personally would not call it a Bible. Jefferson's Bible is, um, the process of doing that is known as scripture, uh, scripture by subtraction. That's a phrase that um, a professor from Boston, Stephen Prothero, came up with, is scripture by uh, subtraction. There's people who do that, even today. Maybe not uh, literally cutting sections of their Bible away, but not reading their entire Bible. Ignoring sections of it. Saying it doesn't apply. It's outdated. There's danger in picking and choosing what parts of God's Word we're willing to accept. When we do so, we skew the Gospel message. Uh, Philip Bentz wrote in his uh, commentary on the book of Acts, we too must remember that a strongly positive response to a false gospel can, in the long run, be more dangerous than a negative response to the true gospel. There are churches that ignore huge chunks of the Bible, and they come up with their own theology based on small parts of the Bible. They say things like, Jesus was a created being. They say Jesus was human. They say Jesus wasn't perfect because he was him. Very dangerous. From the Bible, the book of James lays it out bluntly for us. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. That's found in James chapter 1, verse 22 to 25. We need to remember that we are the created beings, that God is God, and that the Bible is His written revelation. It is His truth for us. We have a responsibility to share and to live by this truth. As we have seen with the world leaders of today who have denied the dangers of COVID-19, a lot of harm can be done when we deny the truth. And we have seen in our scripture today that there's a lot of danger in perverting the truth as well. Ignoring things in the truth and choosing what we want to believe. As followers of Christ, it is our job to seek out the truth from God's Word and to learn it and to live by it and to share it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in our, in our day and age, when it seems that so many believe truth is relative, we want to acknowledge that there is an absolute truth. Help us, God, to hunger to learn more about your truth, and to stay true to your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to close our service with one final song.
Well, friends, that concludes our service for today. I'd encourage you to remember to come and be with us next week, even though I won't be here. Maddie will be here to welcome you and to do Kids Corner, and we have Pastor Don Hume giving uh, a message next week. And so if you want to hear a really good preacher, here he's going to be here next week, right? <laughs> there you go. Uh, while I'm on holidays, I would just uh, say that I'm still available to receive, if there's an emergency, to receive uh, voicemail and text. I will check my phone periodically. Any of the other business of the regular day-to-day -day stuff at the church, I would just ask them to send it to me by email. And when I'm back from my holiday, I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Okay? Fantastic. Thanks for being here, everyone. God bless. <laughs>